Um, but I'm, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Lucero. I'm the chair of Latin American Caribbean Studies. And uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Vincent Phillips back to the University of Washington. I'll just give Dr. Phillips a very short introduction, and he will he'll, uh, direct the rest of the, of the conversation. Uh, Dr. Phillips is a, a retired physician, uh, but he's also something of, a, of an amateur archaeologist, uh, photographer, historian, social scientist, who's been going to Central America since the 1970s. So he has a, a very long relationship with Central America, with Guatemala in particular, and with the work of uh, Dr. Clyde Snow, who was really one of the pioneers in forensic anthropology and human rights work. Um, Dr. Phillips had, has been supported Dr. Snow's work for many years, and has actually been a real friend to the program of Latin American Caribbean Studies. With his help, we've actually established a fund in Dr. Snow's memory, uh, which will now support student uh, research. Uh, that call has gone out broadly. If you haven't received it, please let us know. We're happy to send it to you again. Uh, the deadline is May 1st, and it's open to undergraduates and graduate students who are interested in working on the kind of social justice, social science kind of work that Dr. Snow worked on and that Dr. Phillips is intensely interested in. Uh, today's work will be um, mostly focused on some of the images from a, some very difficult years of violence. As many of you know, Guatemala is a country that has seen uh, over 50 years of political violence, and it continues in, in, in changing forms. Uh, but Dr. Phillips has been lucky enough to uh, have access to some of the photographic archives from the Forensic Anthropology uh, Foundation, and I think he's going to share many of those images with us today and tell us a little bit more about his story. So um, the, we're, we're also hopeful to use these materials in developing new curricula to share some of these stories with local high schools, with universities, and hopefully some of you will be able to be a part of that process as well. So this is the start of a, an ongoing conversation, an ongoing relationship. Um, but before anything else, I just uh, wanted to invite you to help me welcome Dr. Phillips to the University of Washington. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, on Tuesday night, they had uh, Dead Reckoning. It turned out to be three hours on Channel 9. And I'm, they're sending me uh, the DVD, and uh, it, it features uh, Guatemala, Vietnam, Afghanistan, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, Rwanda, fugitive Nazis and all that. And uh, they have Dr. Snow, and they have uh, pretty, uh, pretty personality from the Guatemalan team, and they go to the Morgan archives, and that's so, and they have Rwanda. So, uh, Keep your eyes out for that, and I'm going to donate a copy. Uh, in July, the New York Times Magazine had an article on the team, and I left a copy in the in the office. The Times and National Geographic and Scientific American have been very good. Uh, this uh, is from '93, and I left the copy. This is uh, their first project uh, in Central America was El Masote in El Salvador. And uh, there's a synopsis of the whole thing in the office now. But I did, I'm leaving a disc of this show uh, in the office, and there's a text uh, which is easy to take out of the folder and mimeograph, and it goes through all of this. So I'm going to be uh, a little bit abrupt here. Uh, let's see how bright is it? Yeah, you can just forward it that way. Okay, so. Guatemala is about the size of New York State in the colonial period. It had about a million people. Now it has about 17 million people in the 19th century. They had uh, great plantations set out for coffee, sugar cane, and cotton, and finally bananas. A lot of this was on what used to be Indian land. Uh, and fortunately, the land has not been redistributed since. And uh, uh, banana plantations were the size of Long Island or Rhode Island. Uh, banana Company ended up owning the only port, all the freighters that went to the port, the railroads, the electric country, company, the telephone, the telegram, uh, car dealership, insurance. Basically, they owned about half of Guatemala, and they gave the country of Guatemala a check for $600,000 a year. In 1944, there was a revolution, a new government came in, and this government wanted to build schools, hospitals, uh, roads and give lands to the to the, the Indians. 
And of course, where are they going to get all this from the United Fruit Company? Uh, $600,000 a year is not enough. So the officers of the United Fruit Company were the Dulles brothers, one of whom was Ike's Secretary of Defense, and the other was the director of the CIA. So they went to Ike and said, we're having a lot of trouble with the communists in Guatemala, and we have a little operation to do. And they did their little operation in 54, and it turned out to be very, uh, very simple. You know, they got some old veterans of the Flying Tigers and about a thousand mercenaries. And uh, the Guatemalan government pulled very quickly, went in exile. Um, and then uh, a period of repression went on that mainly involved the lefties in the city, the old Communist Party, the union leaders. Uh, 1960, there was a rebellion uh, in uh, Zacapa, the army mutiny. Uh, that's when they were training the Bay of Pigs on the uh, people on the plantation. The Guatemalan officers found out about it in the mutiny. And they ended up going into the mountains. And then you started having a guerrilla war. And the, 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 they retreated further and further and further and further into the mountains uh, until they were mainly in very sparsely populated Indian territory. And about the same time, uh, the Marinols and the uh, Peace Corps and uh, a lot of NGOs were coming in. So you had this thing where you had the guerrillas, you had Indians in remote areas, and you had liberation theology sort of unpeacefully coexisting. Uh, so anyway, uh, there are 16 uh, distinct Maya languages spoken in Guatemala. There are over 200 distinct communities. Each community has their own costume, and within that community, people dress according to their rank and their clan or part their village, so you can spend your whole life studying textiles. Now, this lady uh, spoke only Kaksha Kelly, so I had to call over a Kaksha Kelly man, speak to him in Spanish. He spoke to her in Kaksha Kelly, uh, and then and translated her back into Spanish for me. And the moral of the story is a lot of, traditionally, the women, uh, the men would go to town or plantations and buy store-bought clothes and speak Spanish, and some of the, the women would, uh, would stay at home and never travel with an unloaded camera. Uh, a lot of the country uh, looks like this. Uh, the highlands are like a tropical alpine climate. Uh, this is a, uh, I think he's Quiche, Daykeeper, the Mayans, uh, all, all those conquistadors burn all the books and all that. But the Mayans kept the 260 day count going. And as far as we can tell, the early stone inscription that we can read uh, allegedly is December 7, 36 BC. And as far as we can tell, the, the, the uh, day count has been going on. And, uh, this fellow will give you uh, your horoscope based on the, your birthday and the, and the calendar. And they used to have a 360-day calendar, a 365-day calendar, a lunar calendar, an eclipse calendar, a Venus almanac, and a bunch of other calendars, um, which I can't understand sometimes. Uh, if you, this is a Tikal. So if you go up there and you read the inscriptions on the dedication there, the, uh, the, day, the day names and all that. And that, that if you go, in other words, you go to Momo Sinango on... Uh, Day eight monkey, all the witch doctors will be there every two and sixty days, and you ask them what day it is, will be this correlate with what's in the inscription and keeping the count. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the designs on the costumes here have been studied extensively. These are shield girls, and uh, the, some of the designs we know are well over a thousand years old, although people don't always remember what they mean, but it's been handed down from mother to daughter and mother to daughter. Uh, uh, domestic seed, corn, beans, squash, you can build pyramids on that. Uh, ceramics are almost gone, they break, so this lady has her water and her uh, kerosene. Uh, doesn't have to worry about them breaking. Uh, these people are not dressed up, to, they dress like this every day. In fact, a lot of this is store-bought clothing, so uh, some of you should go as, even the men are wearing homemade clothing and sold a lot of this. Goes on. Uh, can these people be trained? So uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Hesperian Foundation and all that, uh, where there was no doctor, Don they know I doctor. So they say, can we get an Indian here with like seventh grade literacy in Spanish and train them to be a visiting nurse or a dental hygienist? And the, the story was yes. And uh, so at this point, we've had four Indians graduate from medical school. I think one was here last year. So we have. 
two Guatemalan and two Chiapas Indians. The girls want to go back home and deliver babies, and one guy wants to be a cardiologist, the other one wants to be a general surgeon, and then we got a dentist and a dental hygienist coming down the line, uh, exploring the oral cavity. Uh, this is a wonderful book, by the way. Uh, I used it in El Salvador and in Guatemala, and they really ought to have this in American high schools. Although American high students knew as much about the human body as these, these Indians learn, uh, we'd be way ahead in this country. I mean, people I see in the clinic don't know squat about the body sometime. Uh, this is a diagnostic. That is March 1977. So, what happened? Guatemala had a big earthquake. In 76, and all the NGOs come in, and you know, so we have our pharmacist here and so forth. So that's a typical NGO project. I used to bring uh, the Miranoles and some of the missionaries went into exile during the 80s, so I used to bring them up to speak at Sinai, and the medical students years later would ask me, you know, how they were doing. Uh, you don't train some kid to the city to be a midwife, what you do is you go to the midwife. And you ask her if she wants to be a health promoter. Uh, I left a DVD that has a little bit about that from Peru uh, in the office there. Um, so she's going to be trained to be a like general uh, provider. Uh, these people don't have refrigeration. Breast is best, but what you do is uh, you, she's smelling the uh, formula before she gives it to the baby. Uh, make sure it has its spoils. So you're doing very elementary stuff here. Uh, and now you got, uh, I like the word fragile behind this because it is. So what happened was the government, you're organizing Indians in a country that the government doesn't want you organizing Indians. So I got a lot of stories that people had to leave because, in, like uh, this woman trained Indians, girls to be like visiting nurses and they were all assassinated uh, after the Spanish Embassy massacre and the army was whispering that they're going from house to house to uh, communicate with the guerrillas that kind of thing. So that was what was going on back then. Uh, these are the foods to which we aspire. Uh, the average family probably only has about... I, I was talking to a Peace Corps guy and he said, they sent me here to teach you how to farm and I found they're very good farmers but they, they don't have enough land. and uh, they, have, uh, they have to go work on the plantations for, for a month for about $200 and now they need the cash for food, not just for uh, kerosene and batteries and things. So all the dairy products and vegetables and eggs and all those wonderful things that you can dream about getting. Uh, so here we have the $15 an hour economy and when you go to Cambodia uh, or Guatemala you run into the $15 a week economy and in Bangladesh the average seamstress takes home $68 a month after uh, working 60 hours and hopefully she doesn't get incinerated when the factory burns down. Um, so $3 a day is a good Good work when you can get it. Uh, during uh, World War II, the U.S. Army wanted to was having patrols between California and the Panama Canal. And they wanted to have uh, some airships in Guatemala, and they offered to pay the Indians the American Indian the American minimum wage. And the president said, uh, you, "By law, you can only pay an Indian fifty cents a day in Guatemala." You know, so they had a maximum wage back then. Uh, and then we had the enforcer. This is me here, Victories. He was. Uh, the invisible, well, not all invisible. He was uh, the Minister of Defense under Lucas, the Minister of Defense under Rio Swan. He was the president after Rio Swan. So actually, he was involved in every single massacre that's <laughs> discussed. Same number massacre. Somebody asked me if he was dead, and I said, I can't tell looking at this picture. But <laughs> apparently, he's in the nursing home, he's demented. Uh, so uh, they uh, decided they didn't like all this activity. Uh, direct your attention to the coke workers there, the bottling plant, and this was a union where they went on strike, so they assassinated the president of the union, they elected the new president, and he was assassinated, they elected the new president, they assassinated him. I don't know whether they went to 11 or 16 people. This had nothing to do with the coke company in Atlanta. These were like, uh, there's some going on, uh, that's why they went all. And finally, they decided to kill the journalists. So a bunch of Argentines went in and said, you're very brave men. And we tell your story, and then the journalists find the parking lot, and the journalists were killed. So, you know, anyway, uh, not so bad. So anyway, uh, this is, uh, I believe this is Lieutenant Colonel Molina, uh, uh, a.k.a. President Pinata. And uh, at this time, what's going on is that there's the guerrilla army and poor 
is moving south uh, from Chiapas into the highlands, and the army is moving north, and the missionaries are, and the Indians are sort of in between. So uh, this is Jeannie Reed Simon. She's very charming. I can't tell you that personally. And uh, what was going on is uh, President Mont was in Guatemala City, and Colonel Lemus was in command in Navarre. And Molina was sort of the guy who went, Lieutenant Colonel Molina went back and forth in between. Guatemalan Army in 1980 had 50 generals and 150 colonels on active service, and that's as many generals as Eisenhower commanded on D-Day. So I think that's a lot of manpower that I don't know what to do with. Uh, by this time, the uh, church had been closed by the, you know, basically they killed 11 priests, about 100 cat catechists. They, Closed the, uh, they bombed the, the convent, uh, they took over all the churches, and the uh, Bishop of Harari went into exile, and uh, all, all the churches became uh, military garrisons, and this guy seems to have stolen the, a Browning 50 caliber from a museum. I mean, you, and the equipment down there is a, sort of a museum in itself, so he's got a nice field of fire. Uh, and uh, this picture here has a somewhat more innocent uh, interpretation. The uh, Molina wanted the American attaché, military attaché, come to the ball to see what was going on. And uh, this guy managed to get photographed. And that was too much even for the Reagan administration. So they told him, don't go to the ball anymore. But he's just simply there as a tourist, gets to the Guatemalan Army. Uh, so anyway. Um, what happened was uh, Guatemala, during the Carter administration, Congress cut off the uh, military aid to Guatemala, so they couldn't get any more stuff for the M M16. So they went to the Israelis and they said, you have a, a compatible Galil a rifle we'd like to buy, but we're not going to buy it unless you build a uh, factory here for the ammunition, so that, that way if we get under an embargo from the UN, we can continue making our own ammunition, so you have this whole phase of the Guatemalan army being uh, equipped with Israeli stuff that went on for several years. And these are some guerrillas who came into Navarre who, to grenade the police, police station, and I guess they're checking out whether they're really dead. Oops, I'll take this one. Now there are guerrillas, and this by Vince Heptig, and this is a guerrilla army of the poor, about 40 miles north of Navarre, and a very rare sighting of an AK-47. I only know three or four in Guatemala. Uh, okay, so what year was this back then? Sometime in the 80s. That would be after 82. Sometime between 82 and 88. Yeah, so Gene Marie Simon was there in 82, 83, and then he was there later. Uh, so probably that was the time when things were cooling down, so he could go out and search for girls in the hills. Uh, and the girl here has an M16 captain of the army. About 10% of the girls were, were girls, and it was due to something that somebody had been raped or murdered, and they wanted revenge. Uh, and, and then at the, when the peace treaty came, they all had a big marriage in Guatemala City with all the guerrilla girls. They had a picture of them in uniform and a picture of them with their wedding cake. So uh, now, I call this terrain pain. Now, the main pain for the Guatemalan Army is the terrain. Now, the American Army Division can easily get up 200 helicopters. The entire Guatemalan military, on a good day, can get up 20 helicopters. And um, as time went by in Guatemala, I conceded to the helicopters. There were a lot of places I couldn't get to without a helicopter. So this whole kind of terrain back there is the kind of place that I go on my vacation. And uh, uh, so then the meaning of this is that it's basically impossible for the Army to patrol this area, to garrison this area, to win the hearts and minds of the people, uh, or even to catch them. So um, my, my own term for what happened is what I call preemptive depopulation. Now, in other words, they don't, they, the only resource there are the Indians for manpower, the crops and the livestock. Uh, so the army didn't wait for the guerrillas to come to say, Indians living in a remote area, we got to get them out of there, we can't catch them all. So what they would do is they would just simply go to a village and have a very spectacular massacre, burn people to stake, cut open, pregnant the women with machetes, throw the children into wells, and then all the Indians would get them. The message, so if the guerrillas turned up later, there wouldn't be anybody there for them to, to organize. 
uh, and that's a lot cheaper than trying to send 20 helicopters out once a week with the, you know, combat dog or something. Uh, those people are from a cold. That was Sir Jean Marie Simon. Uh, that was one of the refugee camps run in Guatemala by the evangelists. And uh, this story is scenario. Now, what basically happened is about 200,000 Indians or more ran out into the jungle into in Chiapas, the head in Chiapas, and uh, and 35,000 ended up in uh, refugee camps. So uh, we had some people who were working, uh, missionaries and priests who were working in Guatemala, and we got tapes and pictures from them uh, uh, at Comitán Hospital. Uh, so these people basically on, on the run. And uh, so this is a comics on the hospital had 24 beds and it usually had 100 patients and most of them were children. And uh, this uh, older girl here, I call her a feeding chaperone. And uh, uh, her, her job is to make sure that this girl actually ate enough. Uh, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, the infants did not survive because of, if the mother can't eat, then she can't breastfeed and there obviously there is no a convenience store to get baby formula. So we had this thing, we had children born in the camp, and we had children who were three years older and there were no children in between because they didn't make it. Uh, so what happened is uh, I had been in Guatemala, uh, I was not at the massacre, that's the problem, I'm still here, but the Spanish Embassy Massacre, and one of the Indians, it's a long story, you can read the Ring of book and the Stoll book, but it was Ring of Verna too, so I was working, uh, in, I was in New York in 1982, and I heard that uh, this girl called Rigoberta Minshu was going to be at the uh, NYU Medical School, and I went down and offered my services, and that same day, there was an article in Times about the San Francisco Day Men's Fund Massacre in July, uh, it's 300 Indians were killed, and by the story of Alan Ronnie, so I told her two things, number one, uh, this is a very important story. You must put this in all your leaflets. And number two, uh, I said, I will go down to uh, Chavez and find these people, and then here they are. And to make them more happy, I arrived with the food truck. Uh, and what's basically going on, there were only two Indians from Nantun who had actually survived. And all these Indians were people who saw that, you know, helicopters were arriving, and they were dead Indians. And they took off, which is exactly what the army wanted them to do. You know, so killing them all would have taken a lot of bullets. So, uh, but the Guatemalan army knew they would be coming to this logging road, so they had soldiers on the Guatemalan side of the uh, road, with you know, and so the refugees would run across the logging road into Mexico, and the soldiers would fire at them and even into the houses. But the point is that this is a people were too Maya. And the uh, the Chumaya live in, in the Chiapas too, so they ran into a community of Indians who spoke their language, and took them in, you know, as neighbors. So uh, at this stage, the men have all gone to work somewhere, and it's mainly women and children here. Uh, they're lucky; they're above the malaria zone. They have fresh water. They can talk to their neighbors, and they're getting regular rations. And that our length of their thing about you can feed a child for 25 cents a day. When I was in Guatemala and in El Salvador and all that, I go shopping with the guys from uh, the agency and figure out how much we spent and how many children we we're going to feed per day, and it actually worked out to 25 cents. I know, amazing. Uh, there were people hiding in uh, in the hills. Uh, this is Vince had taken. The priest has arrived. They're going to get marriage and baptism. Okay, so anyway, uh, so called peace agreement. Uh, and uh, people come back uh, to get testimony, uh, and uh, you have uh, Bishop Harari came back, a Remy report, you have the UN report, and then you have the American Academy of Sciences in Oxfam and all that, which were in my closet. Uh, and basically what's going on, you're collecting testimony. So Bishop Harari said he wanted to get, he wanted to have a mask for the dead, and he had to get the names of all the dead to do this. So they had Indian interpret they had Indians in the churches there and people would go and give testimony in Indian language. So unless you spoke the heathen tongue, you didn't know what they were talking about in the back pew. So uh, they got six hundred viewers and they got six thousand five hundred 
interviews and they reported 400 massacres. And this was all published in English and Spanish. And two days later, uh, Bishop Harari was found dead. And uh, the DNA of Colonel Lemus and his son turned up to the, at the crime scene. So I'm not very sophisticated. American Association of Sciences, the same thing. Uh, the UN report, uh, you know, I'm just taking this from that for Brian, for Vedum. Uh, you know, like 30,000. Now, of course, these may be the same people and the same interpreters. You know, I, I talk about this because I've heard testimony in Guatemala uh, from people, and you get this story and that story and the other story, and then you realize as you talk to three people that if you send three different interviewers, you're going to get a different name of the victim, how they died, who killed them, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, so it's just a big jumble. We just say, uh, you, know, the, you know, there are 600 massacre sites in there. Or something. So, 200,000 dead, 90% killed by the army, 8% Maya, uh, or 80%, 90% Maya, uh, killings in that area. It has to be 25% of victims were female because we're including uh, abductions, and some girls were basically taking this comfort women, and they may have survived. And this is the only massacre in Flagranti. Uh, this by Vince Heptig, it's at Santiago de Atitlan. In December 1990, and the uh, Royal Army of the Poor had a radio there operating on the, one of those volcanoes, and the Army couldn't catch them, but they managed to catch and kill about 900 Indians uh, during the interval. And uh, there was a garrison in the town, and then one day uh, a soldier grabbed a teenage girl, and he had a little bit too much to drink, and the girl screamed. And this time, all the Indians came out, and they came to the garrison, and the mayor said, We, we need to talk to the commander. So the, Open fire and you know killed about a dozen Indians and uh, now this is, I've been in this place a couple of times. It's a you know they got nice hotels and things and all that. So there were plenty of tourists in the town and it was all photographed. This is the actual only photograph we have of a massacre in Guatemala Park. So we're going to talk about the uh, exhumation, the archaeology phase of this. Uh, uh, people in Latin American studies are good to get at the ground level here because of this all started in Argentina in 1984 when the mothers of the disappeared wanted the American Academy of Sciences to help them locate their children and grandchildren. So Dr. King from the medical school here did the genetic, and uh, Dr. Snow uh, did the uh, exhumations. And basically, the people who did the exhumation were people like you, you know, that come into a room, and Dr. Snow was doing a slideshow, and they, they volunteered. And that's how he recruited people. Uh, and uh, the Jesuits in, uh, well, typically the case would be a pregnant activist would be kidnapped, taken to, the, to a military hospital, give birth, they give the baby away and kill the mother, that kind of thing. So, you know, uh, uh, a whole different subject. So anyway, what happened was the Jesuits were killed in El Salvador in 89, and uh, President Bush, the older Bush, asked Dr. Snow to lead the investigation, and You'll be surprised to learn that the Army did it. Uh, and, uh, but then um, Snow said, uh, there's a lot of material up here. And he brought the Argentines up, and they did El Mazote in uh, El Salvador. And then they went to Guatemala, and they did Rio Negro and uh, uh, Dos Aires. And they presented in uh, Atlanta in, the, in uh, I think, 94. And there was a Guatemalan from Brooklyn in the in the uh, Adi is Freddie Pesarelli, he volunteered, and I want to work for you. So he sent Pesarelli and the Guatemalans to Bosnia to, for training. And they were digging up Srebrenica, and the Dutch ambassador to NATO comes by and says, Oh, who are these young folks here? And says, They're Guatemalans. He says, Guatemalans in Bosnia. Oh, how come? You see, because the Dutch were involved in Srebrenica massacre, it's a complicated story. Uh, so he immediately contacted Guatemala City and the uh, the Dutch ambassador later came over to the war and gave them half a million dollars, or what I call a weird gal to, from, the, from the Dutch. So that team there, we're going to talk about the work they're using, the protocols that Dr. Snow developed, uh, pre-computer, pre-DNA. Uh, you get a, a request from the court, at least that's what they were doing then, from the community that they want an exclamation. So you go and you go to the church, and you check the baptismal records, and you go to the city hall, you check the records there, and you go to the clinic, and you check the records there, and then you interview the families, 
and you have this form, you know, uh, age, race, sex, how high, right hand and left hand, and anything about the teeth that's particular. Do they have any injuries? What were they wearing? Where they were last seen? What day? Where do you think they are? And they put all this basically on index cards and uh, make a profile of the people they're looking for and then they go look for them. Uh, this lady has an assignment to find this guy here. And then you go to the massacre site and you're basically dealing with closed, closed skeletons at this point. Uh, I'm sure these people smell much better than the congressman did. Uh, and uh, some people were buried with their ID. And, you know, the army would be in a real in a real rush sometimes, and they just push people in ditches. And a Guatemalan soldier has to pay a nickel every time he fires a bullet. So the children were killed with uh, machetes and that kind of thing uh, to save money. Uh, and so they're with the chopstick method, and all of these people are trained, trained in classical archaeology. Uh, uh, I've been to 200 archaeological sites and all that, so that's my, my real hobby. But it's good to see it being put to other techniques. I have pictures of chaps. Uh, you get DNA out of the teeth sometimes. The, the tooth is all you get. Uh, now, the importance of DNA is this. Uh, the snow method, you would find out how tall a person was, what they were wearing, how old they were, and whether they had any missing teeth and all that. You find a person that age, that height, wearing those kind of clothes and missing those teeth, and pretty sure that's him, you know, that you're looking for. Here, you, somebody hands you a bone, and it's just, the, you know, the massacre site, there just might be bones, you know, like the army tried to burn the bodies, and it's all a big mess. But you can drill in the bone, get DNA, and then you can ask people, they say, uh, you know, my brothers and the mass grave and all that. And so you can quickly identify if people were in, uh, in the massacre there or not. And uh, the uh, uh, Army has a very good system uh, out of Honolulu, uh, you know. So uh, anyway, enough shop talk. Uh, and uh, uh, so this, uh, there are several things. There's a, usually a meeting with the community by the anthropologist. Then they have a ceremony to open the exhumation, a ceremony when the bodies are removed to the lab, and the ceremonies when the bodies are returned to the community for burial. Uh, here's the greeter. Now, no story is complete without a dead white man, and we're going to meet him later. Uh, and uh, uh, the, what's going on, they're removing what you would call in block. In other words, you have a grid. And this is box number one from B6, level two, and they just put all the bones and everything in there. So basically, they're stacking the, uh, the massacre site back in these cardboard boxes here. Uh, you don't see very well. So let's uh, gradually recreate the x ray, everything from bullets. I mean, just some idea what, what's in each box. You know what they're going to find. You know how many skulls, how many bullets, so blah blah blah. And then they take the bones out one by one, and here's a femur that's had a lot of damage to it. And the 200 bones is 32 feet or so. Uh, you get ammunition, so uh, you have uh, there's an M1 uh, big round there, and then you have the 5.56 uh, things, and you have M60 machine guns, 60 millimeter mortars, grenade launchers. Etc. So they have a little armies in there. Uh, this is an Austrian gentleman, and he had a very nice ranch near Sayatsu, which I've been by and admired several times. And the military base commander wanted to buy the, made him an offer. He, he couldn't refuse, but he was stupid and he refused it. So a couple of days later, he was found dead um, on the way back from the cantina in Sayatsu. Uh, that military base doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but, it, but basically what happened was somebody uh, was somewhat short, shorter, right hand in the assailant, it was hit in the face and then he fell and uh, got hit in the back of the head. Uh, and the daughter came in from uh, Vienna to give uh, DNA. So this was the, actually their first DNA case. And the Austrians, for some reason, uh, are topping this kind of stuff. So we have our dead white male, so when it's not going to complete. Uh, and uh, so we have some young gentlemen here, and uh, this is a skull of a 10-year-old boy, 
Um, and uh, uh, these are the models of my model demonstration. So a lot of these things you find toys of plastic ponies and dolls and that kind of thing, so they always have a little flesh in there. Uh, uh, something very bad happened to this girl's head, and they're having trouble putting her maxilla back together. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, so there's no ruler here. I didn't want to intrude too much, you know. Uh, but this is 8 and a half by 11 paper, so you can see there are baby teeth and adult teeth sometimes side by side in the skull. Because a uh, kid said, hey, this is her clavicle, so she's not very big, you know, she's sort of fine size. And this is her elbow, which is really a masterpiece. Uh, when you're an adult, it's fused, but there's a epiphysis, a growth plate there. It doesn't close until you go through puberty. So if you find these bones separating the child, that means the child died when they were like eight years old. Uh, and you know, we don't have a lot of dead children in our world in the United States, so you don't get to see the side. So a lot of stuff in the world, Guatemala said, yeah, I never saw a medical school. So, uh, so we would deduce that she sort of looked like this. Uh, and here's a family. Uh, and here's a family. So this is a, the story behind this is that uh, a captain was leading a convoy to a military base. And he was very, very angry. So he decided they were going to kill every Indian they met in a row. So there's an old lady going uh, to the market with the chicken they got her. And there were kids gathering firewood. They would get them. And people working in the fields. So unfortunately, people were working in the fields. And they escaped. They came to this family. And they tied them up in the house, and they doused some kerosene and burned them. We don't know whether they were alive when they were burned. Uh, so you can see the bones are in all different stages of carbonization. And uh, these are skulls, and the part of bone is most resistant to cochlea. There are probably cochleas here, so we're doing there are at least three Indians there. Uh, assuming that even remote Indians only have one head. Yeah. And tribes, I don't know, all the more remote tribes. Uh, so this is uh, Panzas of the First Massacre, May 78. These are Texi people that have a very interesting history. They were pacified by uh, Las Casas, the uh, missionary in the 1500s. And uh, they sent an embassy to Madrid, and they presented the king of Spain with incense, itself, plumes, chocolate, and did dances and sang in choir. And the king was very moved and said, these Texi people are very good, and they are under my protection forever. Uh, and that, that worked okay until independence came, and then the, the government, uh, technically the Indians in Guatemala never had the right individually on land. Uh, so what happened is they found gold, uh, copper, and nickel or something in commercial qualities here, and businessmen and, and lawyers in Guatemala City got rights to uh, the land. So people were arriving in helicopters and jeeps in Guatemala City telling the Indians, uh, this land belongs to us now, so you can stay and work here as our clients, or you can leave. So the Indians went to town hall and said, uh, we've been here a thousand years. Uh, we would like to have titles to our land, like you can invite people in Guatemala City. And the mayor said he didn't have the authority to do this. And the Indians kept coming, so they, they had, uh, the mayor had uh, soldiers on City Hall with machine guns and all this. And the Indians all came to the Grand Plaza, and you know the usual story, a soldier says an Indian trying to grab his gun, so they opened fire, and uh, you know, machine gunned everybody, and they called in reinforcements, and allegedly 200 Indians disappeared, and then the mayor got a backhoe, and people who were in front of the mayor's office were all buried uh, down the road here. So uh, this is, uh, uh, this is by Vince Heptake, and uh, so what's happening here, the thing, site is being opened, uh, to view, uh, and you can see how dangerous Indians were, like they have this stick and they have this bottle, so no wonder you need a machine gun to uh, defend yourself against them. And uh, this is the, I don't remember their name, but these are the, uh, you know, like the UN observers and all that. Now, I mean, it's all a legal process here at this point. And these are catching priestesses, and they're, uh, you know, doing their thing. And uh, that, that, that's really great. It's like she's giving this guy ambrosia or something. I mean, so that's these big catchy people. Uh, this is a shield, this is a cool. Uh, what's interesting, these towns, there are very few white people, maybe a priest or a government commissioner would come a couple times a year, but they have they have churches dating back, uh, chapels dating back to the 1540s, so the, the uh, priests were very uh, conscientious about their 
propagating the faith. So we, we know these communities have been there for a long time. Uh, but this is in the mountains, okay? So you have a thing, the guerrillas are coming in from the north, and the army's coming in from the south, and sooner or later they're going to go through search and evade, but they will encounter each other, and since the guerrillas uh, know the terrain and the people better, it's the army that gets in ambushed, and so what the army does, uh, they go to the nearest village and uh, kill everybody. Uh, is a lesson. So that, uh, that had happened near a cool. Uh, so people got together, and they said, shall we go to the mountains, shall we stay here? And he said, well, we haven't done anything wrong, so we're going to stay here. So like clockwork, uh, one morning, it's very cloudy, the men are going out in the field. Uh, five of the men are immediately shot. By the, by the soldiers as they go into the field, and then the soldiers come into town and line up all the men, and they have a guy with a hood on, and he points, you, 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 and they take them back to the church and uh, torture them or whatever. And then they uh, uh, say, okay, you guys here, you need to build a, dig us a grave big enough for you to stand in. And they say, oh my God, this is it. And then after a while, I said, this is deep enough, this is grave is not for you, it's for the delinquents and the church. And they bring the young men out and they push him into the, uh, the pit and they fire down on them. You can see the bullet tracings here. Uh, and then the, the colonel was in a good mood and he says, uh, since you all work very hard, I'm going to let you go and give you a head start in the hills. And these people will wander around in the jungle for about a, uh, a couple months into them in a refugee camp. Uh, this is they're removing the... Uh, now how can a uh, teenage girl carry grown men on her head to the skull and only weighs about 30, 35 pounds? Uh, this is Chell, another one of these boys. Uh, the priests and the, everybody who went to Chell were assassinated. And then the guerrillas came into town and they uh, had a trial and they took a nurse and a, and a butcher and accused them of being collaborators with the armies and killed them. Uh, and then it was a child molester and they beat him up and told him to leave town. The child molester came back with soldiers a couple of days later and pointed to six men who were promptly disappeared by the army, so the people got together and said, the girls are angry, the army is angry, better hide in the hills. So then, many months later, a soldier comes and says, oh, we have a new president now, uh, General Mont, he loves Indians, he's a Christian gentleman, he won't harm you, come back to the village, show you're not afraid, you'll be safe. So a lot of people did that, and like clockwork, um, after the wind warning was fog, and most of the men had gone to the fields, they came into town, and it's mainly, they found about 100 women and children and senior citizens there, and they took him to the uh, waterfall and started cutting off the heads of the machete, which I'm sure is a lot, of, a lot of work. So, you know, the officer said, we got to get back to base, you know, it's going to get dark. So they turned around and had the smoke, and then the soldiers, when an afternoon working, they let some of the children escape, and this officer turned around and says, okay, we're in a rush, you just shoot everybody, and then they left, and the people from the hill came, and they retrieved the bodies and buried them, so these people were buried by people who knew them, so they were grouped. So if you have a man and a woman, a bunch of children, that's a family. You have a bunch of uh, children with women on top, that's a mother and a children. You have three old men together, they used to play cards together. Uh, so they re managed to retrieve 60 bodies, and there were nine males of military age, between 12 and 60, and the rest were women and children, and then some senior citizens. Uh, and this team, they're very, they're very sensitive about what, you know, Debating whether they should let me have pictures of skeletons and the names at the same time. Uh, so it's uh, something very bad has happened to this lady's head, and uh, she's wearing these earrings here. And here we have a model, and I'm sure the team was very, uh, very glad to have something with flesh to <laughs> that day. Uh, and a girl like this might actually be taken as a trophy back to the military base and kept as a comfort woman. Uh, so when we say 25% of the victims are female, you know, you know, uh, that counts for that. Uh, this is Sashka Uh This is a site of, this is a church that was built on top of a temple that was very important to the king of Piché, these Piché people. And uh, so what you realize is that the churches in Guatemala are built on top of ancient Mayan shrines. So when you go in, there are witch doctors there uh, all the time. Uh, so anyway, uh, the army came in, the church had been down in the earthquake, the army came in and used it as headquarters, and they brought in, this uh, <laughs> happened under Lucas, Mont, and then the you know, victories, they bring in Indians for questioning, and they wouldn't 
come out and people will have screams when there'll be dogs wandering around town with body parts. Um, so uh, the, the army left and said, uh, you, you can have your church back. So this is uh, reminds me of an ancient Mayan thing called opening a building by fire. And we see this at Karako, Copan, and Tony Na. And we have inscriptions that refer to it. So the king would go to his grandfather's temple and go down to his grandfather's tomb to make offerings and retrieve heirlooms. And then a hundred years later, then another king would do that. So I sort of imagine what this is like. And I sort of look at these guys now as uh, our colleagues. <laughs> you know, we do our magic and they do their magic, okay? And they can keep me the magic for 2,000 years, so do your thing. So it just struck me that just so much like the, the, what's described in the hieroglyphs or opening a building by fire. This is the ancestors. I call this lady Coach Sosie Ketchel, that's the Essex Goddess of Flowers. And the witch doctors, and I know that this refers to a story in a hopeful rule where the heroes are in a dungeon, and the warden says, uh, Tomorrow the king will execute you unless you present him with a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Ho, ho, ho. So the guards go away, and the heroes talk to the ants because they can talk to the animals. And the ants go into the gardens of the underworld, and they take the cut up flower. You don't care so much, you know what that is. And they cut up the flowers and bring them. And then when the jailer comes back in the morning, they're all, it's like a forest we shall. So there, this story has many chapters. So I know, I know the witch doctors know this story as well as I do. Uh, anyways, the story here, they found 26 guys. What was going on, and they had pits in the floor of the church. And this is very common. Uh, uh, testimony we get. There are survivors, and they would put the prisoners down there, and they drag them out, and torture them, and throw them back, and drag them out, and torture them, and throw them back. So, uh, how do we know they did this for long? Because they have serial fractures, and the fracture starts to heal after about a week. So you get a fracture here that's three weeks old, and a fracture here that's two weeks old, and a fracture here that's one week old, and you get a broken bone that's fresh. And then apparently the prisoner died and they didn't need him anymore. They just pushed him back and put cement uh, over the pit. And uh, they kept going until they got down to pre-Columbian artifacts. And I didn't have, uh, I've never asked this doctor if this is the actual pyramid of the sacred stone of Tohio. Uh, my uh, action kelly is very rusty. Anyway, so that's that. So anyway, uh, we, can, we can have lights now, I guess. So uh, there is a disc. All these pictures are on a disc uh, that you can look at, and all everything here with footnotes. I had to stop at some point because I didn't want to write War and Peace. So uh, there, are, there are some stories that go with the pictures, and uh, uh, that's uh, Tony has it in the office there, and you can take that out and Xerox it. That you can sit home and look at each picture, and there'll be a discussion of that. And then there'll be discussions about uh, some of the techniques, and then a uh, story from you know, Cambodia or El Salvador that illustrate parallel stories. Uh, so anyway, so that uh, uh, that's what I do on my vacation. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Dr. Phillips. That was, that was really impressive. Uh, uh, we have a lot of knowledge in this room, too. There are many folks here who are familiar with with Guatemala, familiar with this history, so I'd love to open it up for, for questions and conversation and just to hear what you take away. One, one of the things I take away from your presentation, Dr. Phillips, is just how, how global the story is, right? This is, in some ways, it's a Central American story, but it's already entangled with U.S. capital, U.S. corporations from the beginning, the United States building projects, and then U.S. social science goes to South America and comes back and goes to Bosnia and Iraq and beyond. So it's really, it's a story that just keeps on getting bigger in some ways. So uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. Yeah, and each country handles it, it differently. And in Cambodia, it's very open because the people, the Vietnamese came into Viet, uh, Cambodia in 79. So it's very easy to say, look at those bastards, look what they did, and then... Uh, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of educated Cambodians now who uh, are survivors, so, you know, uh, they speak English and French very well, so they're very happy to stay in a hotel room for two hours telling their life story. And uh, 
uh, for instance, the French left 200 curators behind at Angor to protect the ruins. And so the first thing the captain asks, uh, does anyone here speak French? A couple of hands go up. Has anyone here worked with Frenchmen? All the hands go up. They took him outside a machine gun, and they went to the ballet school, and there were like 200 girls there, and they say, has anybody here been to a foreign country? Does anybody speak a foreign language? <coughs> they all disappear. So, you know, so uh, when you're doing archaeology in Cambodia, you have to have a Buddhist priest and a demolition guy there to make sure the area has been demined. And then any skeletal material you're going to find on the surface is from the 1970s, so you have to be very polite with the pieces of somebody's grandmother. And we were in excavation in a front, uh, Iron Age village uh, from 500 BC, was built on top of a village that had been napalm by Lan Nol, and the well, the village well, went through the Iron Age thing. So you had modern skeletons from the 70s in the well, and then you had skeletons that were 2,500 years old next to the well, about a yard apart. So you had like parallel exca excavation going on. Anyway, so questions? Dr. Vincent, how did you get interested in this as your hobby? Um, well, no, I read uh, books about the great explorers, and uh, I wanted to go, and it just happens that a lot of these countries that have these lost cities in the jungle have, have had problems. So uh, Guatemala has problems, and Cambodia has problems, Sri Lanka has problems, and then, you know, I went with medical people. So uh, if you go to El Salvador, you make a courtesy call. Uh, El Salvador wasn't really safe to go to the ruins when I was there. It was in the 80s. Uh, so I, I just, I, we, I was actually part of a sanctuary church. And so when there was an assassination in El Salvador or Guatemala, we sort of go down and make a, a, a consolation visit, uh, you know, show the flag, and the Gringos are here. United States and Canada and Ireland are all very concerned about what happened with the Father Solis and the nuns. And, you know, the Army was very polite, you know. Uh, you know, I was able to go, in, as long as I was there with the missionary, I was able to go anywhere. Uh, well, not everywhere, but, you know, I would run into the Army in the morning and the girls at night, and everybody knew I was going back and forth. Uh, but uh, I was sort of, you know, searching the vague pattern that was going on. In and uh, other countries, uh, well, you see the medical tape. And, you know, Peru, you, Peru you're not, you don't have to dodge bullets, you know. You go right to the right. Yeah, so. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more about kind of the, the role of being able to do DNA matching, because you explained, I think, some before about Dr. Snow's methodology of, like, identifying based on descriptions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when did DNA Well, well, well what happened was is he, he has an interesting career. He was in the Air Force. They had hired him to investigate airline crashes in the 60s and 70s. They didn't have any DNA. And they got jumbled just with 200 and 300 people. So uh, no computers, no DNA, and you just ask people to send photographs and descriptions of their loved ones, and, uh, you know, you had this hangar full of skeletons and burned bodies, and you start from scratch. So he developed a system uh, that worked very well. The Akul is probably the prototype of that. They made a graph of what the people were supposed to look at, and then the people that actually fell, and they made a graph. And it, well, I mean, the people who were giving testimony knew the victims, you know, like when they were knee high, so they very good descriptions. But the point is there you have to have like an intact body and some kind of testimony. Whereas here somebody just hands you a bone is, a, is a, you know, is this my, my, my brother, you know? So you take DNA on a bone, could be a tooth, could be a finger, and you take blood there and say, yeah, it's a good match. And it's all computerized. I don't know anything. I haven't done any DNA work since 1990. So it's all, it's all new to me. And it's obviously the power of... Uh, Technology is moved. So the, the issue there is that uh, it's not just a matter of identifying people, but verifying how they died. You know, so you want to have the the bullets, the testimony, and all that to go with with the with the crime scene. Uh, and he pioneered a lot of other things. So.
Uh, Dr. King might know, but I know she's very busy. Uh, so I haven't talked to her in years, but she probably, she actually did some of the first DNA work for Guatemala uh, many years ago. Uh, it turns out, though, uh, a, lot of, a lot of mistakes can be made in the field. You have to do it just right. Uh, for instance, people with sterilized thing which doesn't destroy DNA. So it was sterile, but by the time you've taken samples from 10 bodies, the saw has samples from 10 individuals. It's been transferred to all, all the skeleton. So, I mean, you have to make sure people do everything right to, to make it work um, in the technical field. Thank you for your um, talk and um, sharing some of the company pictures. Um, I was wondering, uh, I don't know if I got it right, your main purpose was to find out how the people, people were killed, not identifying like, or like find their relatives, is that what you Well, I mean, the point is the village has to ask you for the exhumation, so they're going to ask you to, to find the people that were killed. So. Uh, you know, in other words, you just don't go and, I mean, there are stories where you go in the jungle and you find something and it turns out there was a village there and you dig it up and there are bodies there. But what's going on, uh, the way it's supposed to work is that there's a community where there was a massacre and the people in the community, they want to find the remains of their loved ones. You know, and sometimes in countries like Iraq, that, that's all that happens. You know, you've got a mob of people trying to grab bones. Uh, because they already know that Saddam Hussein killed everybody, so they just want their bones and get out of there really quick. They don't even care <laughs> whose bones it is. But here it's a community asking, and uh, they want to have a proper funeral, and they want to have the witch doctor there, and the priest there, and everybody in the village there. So it's very important to try to, to know who's who. So is there, is, uh, is there like a, the equivalent of what we have in Argentina, like the black bound? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, the Argentine team, uh, I, I, think, I don't know, did you get my thing I sent you, the Argentine team thing? Yeah. Uh, no, no, this is basically an extension of the Argentine team. You know, in other words, uh, the Guatemalans were sent to Bosnia and trained by the Argentines in Bosnia. You know, I mean, in other words, they don't want a hired gun. You know, they want a guy who's been to Ethiopia, been to Bosnia, been to Iraq, been to East Timor, and then you go back to your own country, and then you testify against the president. You know, they just want to have a guy that, well, of course he knows the president's guilty. That's why they fabricated all this evidence. But then, you know, you got a PhD and a diploma and a badge from the UN, you know, and you testify against somebody, so-and-so in some other country. So that, that's, that's the way the system works. You know, Clyde is, uh, you know, he's has a regular and a regular witness for the prosecution job, you know, uh, John Wayne Gacy uh, identifying Joseph Mengele in Brazil and all that. So, so he deals with regular cases, so he tries to have whatever the team's doing mimic what he would do if he were going to take this thing to court. That's how he does it. And as somebody has, uh, you know, like the bullets, you can uh, identify, they have a signature on them, uh, so he has a ballistics guy, and you say that these bullets all came from the same gun, and this other victim, another gun, was shot, you know, so even if they're all, you know, M16s or G3s, you can say this soldier caught these three people, and this soldier killed this guy, and then three soldiers shot the other guy, because he can look under the microscope and check the, the markings on the bullets, you know. So, I mean, he, he does all this, that's what he you know, does for, for a living, you know, the support is probably. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question about a comment you made in passing for, on about one of the photos. You mentioned um, there was some controversy about taking pictures of these bones, and so I was wondering if you could expand upon that a bit and maybe well, there were, there, this is back in 99 that I was given a lot of these pictures. So at that time, there were two issues going. Number one, this was going to be used in court someday. So they didn't want General Mon or somebody looking on the internet to see what, you know, his lawyer there, what they, they might charge him with. That was number one. Number two is that uh, these pictures really belong to the community. 
in a sense. So, so the Indians actually often do say yes. And, you know, this is my son's skull here, and you can take my picture with it. But it's better to ask people. So that's why some of these pictures are, are kind of anonymous because the persons in the picture weren't actually asked, "Do you want these pictures to be seen in Seattle, Washington, or something like that?" Uh, yeah, yeah. So the the, the you do you can probably get the New York Times for um, July third uh, last year two sixteen. There's a story there, and then uh, Dead Reckoning. They spent about a half an hour with the Guatemalans and Dr. Stowe uh, in Guatemala. So that's the second hour they had that. Uh, and, and it is continuing, and then my frustration is uh, uh, I, I don't understand how you can have a Department of Anthropology or a Department of Latin American Studies or something and not have this as part of the curriculum. You know, there's, there's not enough here to make a course out of this, you know. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, somebody could try to make a course out of this and, you know, do a course on French Anthropology. I just think there ought to be a lesson about it. And it's good to have it, you know, for discussion from different countries. You know, like when I was in Sri Lanka, it was all very recent, and people definitely didn't want to talk about it because this is the new Sri Lanka. That all stuff we haven't done that in a couple of years. You know, uh, versus in Cambodia, that was the bad old guys that did this. And now Guatemala is more, and El Salvador is more difficult because the governments there are in a you know, they, go, they come in back and forth, but you're asking the governments sort of to investigate themselves. You know what I mean? They can't necessarily pin everything on, on the past president. You know, I mean, I, that was my, if Clyde needs a vacation, you ought to go back to the Congo and identify those people the president buried in his backyard again. You know, he needs to relax. You know, that, that's my description of Clyde's still vacation. What's your question about whether the work is continuing or whether this kind of violence well, is continuing? What is going on? Because oh, oh what's a, going on now? There was, a, there was a speaker who was here a few months ago that talked about a village called Sepo Zarka, where the women had taken a case. They had been oh, yeah, prostituted yeah. And, and made housekeepers and things for the yeah, army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's so, going on? So there are plenty of bodies. I mean, no, no, this was they're not going to run. Well, there are plenty of victims. They're not. Like I say, the, the colonel might take that young lady there, very pretty, back to the base and uh, for entertainment purposes and their pictures of, of the soldiers having a dance and the girls from the refugee camp dancing with the soldiers to prove that everybody's friendly, but you, when the lights go out, you know, who knows what happens. But right now the process I think you're referring to is the reckoning with those kind of What's yes, going because on? they How were actually just able to take a case right. and oh, yeah, some justice. justice. That, that, that's the whole point of all this, to, to take a case. You know, I mean, I don't expect Rio Tamont to go to the guillotine or something. I just, you know, I just feel that the people need their day in court. I, I think, you know, not everybody in Guatemala is, is happy about this. In other words, the fact that you are not happy about the French team doesn't mean you, you approve of genocide. It's just a very painful thing for your country. But the other side of the coin is... Uh, uh, now it's probably going to be hard for the army to just come in and kill people. Like Rio Negro, they killed all those Indians because they were resisting a dam. And in Panzos, they killed all those Indians because they were resisting a mine. So now you got a thing in Guatemala where the Indians are resisting the dam and they're resisting the mine. And I'm very neutral about that because I use oil and metal and everything every day. And so I can't tell people that they can't have hydroelectric power or something. But the issue is, the issue is what's in it for us? I mean, you know, the Army said, we're going to build a dime here, you have to leave. And the Indians said, we've been here a thousand years, what's in it for us? And one thing leads to another. So they said, it's all going to be a lot cheaper to kill the Indians than to move them. And that, that's what Rio Negro is all about. But uh, now, now people have video and all that in there. Well, I mean, I didn't mention accompaniment, but none of this would have been possible without accompaniment, you know. And, uh, I remember we talked about that we organized the first company meeting in New York in '83, and there was a, we said all the people coming back from Seattle, we got to talk about 
how we're going to support Kami Tan Hospital. And then I said, well, these people are going to be moved to Campeche, and then I said, go back to Guatemala, and I guess we should accompany them. And then another girl said, well, we'll call it company. And that's where the, the name company had come, was born in my, in my apartment in July of 1983. I said, well, I'm going to come So I never, I never went on a company, but, you know, I have a job. So, uh, but I mean, man, whole thing. Uh, to get the Indians in from the Ashil Indians in to Guatemala to testify, testify you know, they, they may not speak Spanish, they don't know anybody in Guatemala City, is it safe? Where are you going to stay? Well, somebody, you know, there will they be an interpreter there. So basically, you have somebody who's been living in the community with the Indians, they get in a jeep or a plane, they bring the Indians to Guatemala City, they go to the Hotel Spring or wherever places that they're using, or a uh, convent, the Indians are there, the, the human rights workers, the interpreters, take them through the trial. You put on microphones, the Indians can hear the testimony in the shill or Kekchi or whatever the language of the day is. We as one has to listen to it in Spanish. The, the nun or the, the nurse takes, uh, volunteer takes the Indians back to the hotel, make sure they're fed, make sure they're safe, make sure they get back to the village, blah, blah, blah. This is all, you know, like there were, there were basically two angles coming from this, or three. There was the GAM, the Grupo Apoyo Muchual which I visited, and basically what was happening was uh, a support group for members of the di disappear, and then the support group for the members of the disappear started disappearing. So then there was something called the International Peace Brigade, and the basic idea they get volunteers from Europe, from Italy,